All right, folks, uh, good morning, good afternoon, depending on what part of the world you're joining us from. Uh, Edgar Virial here, again, your uh, VA section chair for Division 18. Uh, really good to have you all here today. Really excited to get this, um, this new webinar series uh, started, and, and hopefully this can become a webinar series that we can uh, focus on on an annual basis. Really glad to be able to bring to you some really great presenters like Dr. Stajenji and uh, others who will be joining us here over the next couple of months uh, to kick off our psychology as agents of change. Uh, so really what started the series was uh, I think the important role that psychology can play in terms of uh, advocating both at the patient level, at the system level, at the community level, uh, and to really kind of bring attention to the issue of psychologists as, as advocates and how do we leverage our role and our expertise to really be able to uh, enhance change in the areas that that we're in. So we did send out an announcement about this. I'm going to briefly share it with you here. Uh, our webinar series kicks off today, uh, May 1st, and today we're going to be focusing in on navigating hospital-wide changes for trans-identified and gender-diverse individuals by Dr. Uh, Annie Sajenji. And uh, we're going to then move into the month of June 5th, where we're going to talk about increasing the field's impact on social justice. Dr. April Alexander will be joining us next month. And then we will wrap up our series in July when we will have Ms. Conwell Smith from ABA, APA's Advocacy Office, who will be presenting to us on advocacy in action, leading with science and positioning yourself as a resource for key partners. So if you haven't already registered for those, would definitely encourage you to do so. All you have to do is click on those distinct uh, Zoom links and they'll take you to the registration page. Um, I'm going to go ahead and talk to you about some housekeeping issues before we jump into our presentation and I introduce to you today's presenter. Um, so a couple of housekeeping issues is that uh, the Division 18 uh, committee is what supports our Division 18 webinars. We're really grateful for all of their efforts. They are here today, including myself, in their own individual capacities. Even though we work for the VA, we don't necessarily represent the views of the VA, and we are all here supporting these efforts on our own personal time. I also wanted to share with you that Division 18 VA section does not tolerate disrespectful language or behaviors, uh, psychological or verbal abuse during our webinars. So in individuals engaging in any of these behaviors will be removed from our webinars. If you have any complaints or questions, you're welcome to reach out to our Division 18 VA section chair, which is myself, and happy to address those concerns for you. All of our webinars are recorded, and they are posted on our YouTube channel. They're also posted on our Division 18 webpage, where we have not only our recordings, but also the presentation material uh, for each of our presenters. Uh, we will be taking questions during the presentation. Uh, Dr. Sajenji uh, prefers that those questions be held uh, until the end of her uh, presentation. We will be looking at the Q&A function and the chat in order to kind of look at your questions. We would encourage you to use the Q&A feature because it really allows us to better track your questions rather than trying to look for them in the chat box. But please go ahead and put those in there throughout the presentation and then we'll call attention to those near the end of the presentation. There's a lot of information here to share with you <laughs> regarding our, uh, our, our continuing education uh, information. So I wanted to let folks know that we will be dropping that information in the chat for you to review. If you're a Division 18 member, you do get free CEs for this event. If you're not a Division 18 member, uh, you obviously would st are still given the opportunity to register for the webinar and you would still get credit. In order for you to get credit for the CEs, you do have to stay for at least 45 minutes of each presentation in order for you to get credit for that. Um, and if you're a non-Division 18 member who is requesting CEUs, you must have paid for those CEUs uh, before uh, today's presentation. We do ask that if you are joining us over phone, 
there's no way of us really being able to identify who you are. So it makes it a little bit challenging to be able to process those CEUs. So if you are joining us over phone and did not actually join us through the web link that allows us to see your name, please email us. You can email the Division 18 VA Section Webinar Committee and let us know that you attended. Give us your name and your phone number so we can make sure that we track your attendance and provide you with that certificate. It does take us about four to six weeks to be able to uh, process those certificates, so we ask for your patience and your grace as our webinar committee works feverishly to try to um, make sure that we can get those certificates sent out to you in time. All right, so those are our housekeeping issues. I'm gonna go ahead and jump into our introduction here. Uh, again, today we're gonna to be focusing in on navigating hospital-wide changes for trans-identified and gender-diverse individuals. So uh, Dr. Sajenji will be describing her experience, creating and leading a task force for cultural inclusion and share recommendations for recruitment, fostering by and developing key partnerships and implementing reformative tasks specific to gender diverse individuals and assessing progress along with barriers to change and growth. She is a licensed psychologist who has worked with severe mental illness in adults for state hospital settings for the past six years, earned her undergraduate degree from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas in 2012, and graduated with a PsyD in clinical psychology from Adler School of Professional Psychology in 2017. She's been a staff psychologist and senior design uh, designated examiner for psychiatric inpatient hospitals in Idaho, and she is the site training director and diversity committee chair of Idaho Psychology Internship Consortium. She founded and chairs the state's hospital task force for cultural inclusion, is the co-founder for and co-chair of Idaho Psychological Association uh, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Task Force. She is also the public sector representative on the board member of the Advocacy Committee member for Idaho Psychological Association, and she is also a Diversity Committee member for Division 18. Her passions are social justice, human rights, macro level changes, uh, greatly uh, fostered by her education in Las Vegas and Chicago, and uh, she very much enjoys daily working, uh, conducting psychological as uh, assessments, restoring patients' legal competency, uh, to proceedings and providing clinical supervision for doctoral level psychology students. So needless to say, we are very fortunate to have her expertise here in our discussion today. So uh, Dr. Sajenji, again, welcome to our webinar series. Really glad to have you here. I'm gonna turn it over to you uh, to, for you to share your screen and for you to begin your presentation. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I'm really honored to be here to offer my experience, and hopefully it'll give you a menu of options of things that you may feel inspired to implement in your settings. Um, so just the initial disclaimer, my shared views are my own and do not reflect the views of my employer. And then um, my presentation will not address the needs for trans-identified youth. At this point in time, I only work with adults and that and adults are is the only population within our setting currently. And so a lot of my literature discusses adult care and standards. Um, so the ob objectives will be to uh, learn some care considerations for developing your own program and then standard of care, standards of care within a hospital setting uh, for promoting um, and meeting the needs for gender diverse clientele. Um, so according to the standards of care for the health of transgender and gender diverse people, version eight, um, within the general population, there are 0.3 to 0.5% of individuals who identify as transgender, um, and then 0.3 to 4.5%, um, and that is all transgender and gender diverse people, um, and that's for adults. For children and adolescents, the statistics are a little different. 1.2 uh, to 2.7% identifies transgender, and then 2.5 to 8.4% uh, 
um, that includes all gender diverse people. Uh, some introductory terms that um, maybe review for a lot of you, um, but um, for the language I'll be using throughout, I'll be using gender diverse, um, and that encompasses, um, let's see, it's an umbrella term uh, to describe gender identities that differ from gender norms associated with sex assigned at birth. Um, and then there's a distinction between binary identities and gender non-binary identities. Um, and so just to describe some of the risks um, for gender diverse individuals, there's minority status stress. And so this is socially induced stress that is above and beyond uh, what's generally experienced by all people. And, and those things include you know, prejudice, discrimination, different forms of exclusion and so on. And so that can definitely um, induce symptoms of uh, mental illness that are um, considered to be socially created. Um, so sexual and gender diverse individuals are less likely to find therapy as beneficial. So there's higher dropout rates. Um, a lot of times that has to do with the barrier, which is low, cultural confidence with this population. Um, there's loneliness and isolation that occurs. And a lot of times um, to combat this, gender affirming care involves connecting uh, the gender diverse patient or client with support groups and opportunities to gather where gender diverse people can convene and feel safe. Um, and then there are disproportionately higher rates of depression, functional disability, obesity, substance use, HIV, uh, suicidality, and emotional distress. Um, as policy changes occur at the national and state levels, there can be migrations to where those rights are more preserved. Um, so bigger cities typically um, and so when gender diverse people leave the more rural areas, um, th that can also create just more isolation for those uh, gender diverse individuals who don't have the privilege or they're not able to leave the state. Um, and then, yeah, just general social pressures to adhere to traditional norms. Um, and that can a lot of times involve or cause internalized transphobia, internalized self-hate. So gender affirming care um, and psychotherapy a lot of times involves, you know, self-acceptance and increasing self-esteem and empowerment um, amid, uh, in spite of all these societal illnesses that are around them that are creating this rejection. Um, so some resiliencies, um, you know, I'd like to speak to the bravery that comes with accepting um, oneself as a gender diverse person living in a society where there are lots of challenges to gender diverse people's rights. Um, there's more of a conscious effort at really um, seeking out and selecting people who are good for one's mental health, who are supportive also known as a chosen family, um, especially if someone's family of origin is um, rejecting, um, there's this need to seek out other supports. Um, and then, you know, for people who are part of the gender diverse community, there's a sense of belonging. Um, and then, you know, as someone who's gender diverse ages, there's more, um, psychological resilience. There's more preparedness for that integrity versus despair um, developmental stage in one's life. Um, that can be due to just engagement in therapy um, and then also just being more thoughtful about who you're selecting to be within your support system. Um, and through the process of those things, there's more reflection on one's integrity. So what's interpersonal values? What do you value? 
um, and what kind of relationships based on those values are you wanting to have for yourself? So there's just um, more intentionality that um, leaves people more resilient as they get to um, that integrity versus despair developmental stage. Okay, so moving on after that overview, I'm going to talk about how the task force was created. Um, and so the initial steps were to create an abstract, submit that to my administration. Once that was approved of, um, then there, there was basically an announcement of that approval at clinical meetings. Um, so our clinicians, our social workers who work within the hospital, um, we gather once a month. And so at those monthly meetings, I felt like that was a good channel of communication to recruit. Um, so gathering emails to put on my roster. Um, initially, we started out as meeting at the lunchtime hour. Um, but as more and more people wanted to attend and be on the roster, we moved it to, um, I think it's one o'clock on a monthly basis, every third or fourth Thursday of the week. <laughs> um, I also use newsletter articles. Um, and then if I'm hosting a training, I definitely use that as an opportunity to plug that we're still recruiting, we're still interested in people joining the task force. And then just talking to frontliners like psych techs and nursing staff on the units um, to share that this is an opportunity that they can be a part of. So <clears throat> before I move on to the next slide, I wanted to ask the group, you know, what do you think would be some effective ways to getting people within your organization um, to buy into the mission of making care at your at your setting and within your environment more trans affirmative? It's a really important question. And if you want to answer uh, Dr. Sujanji's question, you're welcome to do that in the chat. Or if you want to raise your hand, uh, I'm able to uh, allow you to unmute yourself. So whatever way you feel best, you can drop it in the chat or raise your hand. And I'm able to allow you to, OK. I'm going to go ahead and unmute some folks. I, I think that that's a, a really interesting question and, and often like kind of where the rubber meets the road uh, for in, in my system, particularly. I'm wondering if like um, if there were folks who were willing to bring up either like situations where um, either care went well or care was missed um, during um, like we have all of these um, psychology meetings monthly or you know we have treatment team meetings weekly like if there was a place where like uh trans care was highlighted as like you know this went really well or an example an example of a, a a clinician who was able to provide that or an example where the system didn't have what it needed uh, where we where we like would uh you know not necessarily like blaming anyone but like taking accountability for when things fall through yeah, thank you for that. What I'm hearing is starting out with maybe a strengths based perspective and celebrating what's gone well, and then also incorporating and discussing um, where there are areas for growth. Yeah, I mean, ideally, right? Mm -hmm. Awesome. And I'll read some of the ones that I'm seeing in the chat. Um, so Marie mentions leadership support for the committee is important and starting by sharing the found foundational info with with newsletters to kind of generate uh, more awareness around pronouns and gender ID, etc. So it sounds like folks are talking about leadership support and foundational efforts. Yeah, those are definitely important. 
<clears throat> and I like that idea of sharing foundational information within the newsletter. I'm going to steal that. <laughs> And what I felt like so far, let's see, my slide's not, there we go. What I felt like so far has worked um, has been getting community input. And so, and making that input as democratic as possible in terms of shared decision making among the task force members. Um, so, at first, I had a long laundry list of things to do that I felt like um, could improve our setting. And so I created a doodle poll and then put that out to the task force members, like here are some options and then had them vote on what we should work on first. Um, we're planning on hosting a forum this year, end of July, so that'll be exciting. <clears throat> Again, that'll be an opportunity to recruit and then we're going to be looking into um, funding for the creation of a suggestion box. So something that's really um, has a lot of physical integrity and it's a lock box so that there's confidentiality and anonymity in what people are offering as suggestions and questions. Um, and on that, we would also advertise that we're an open group and we're always looking for new members. Okay, so our structure right now is action oriented, like task oriented, centralized. So that means a very small group of people who um, are initiating and taking on the responsibility of these tasks. And then watchdog model just means um, the tasks are identified and they um, come from a place of seeing where there's room for improvement. And then depending on the task that we're working on, um, we invite specific people from uh, a specific department within the hospital um, so that they can help implement whatever task it is we're working on. Um, we also manage a separate group and that's for taking on the big humongous task of creating a trans affirmative room placement guidelines. That's turned into something that is much more expanded and includes um, subpopulations within our hospital population, like uh, individuals with uh, special medical needs, uh, individuals with sensory deficits, and individuals who have um, a lot of agitation associated with mania and things like that. You know, how are we placing them? Um, and how can we be more intentional in our decision making for those individuals? So um, a recommended structure is to decentralize and disperse the responsibility in a more integrated fashion throughout the organization so that there are subunits of with leadership, um, so leadership groups within each unit, so that could be within each department. And they have their own action plans that are in line with the overall mission of increasing uh, inclusivity and um, equity and diversity and also trans affirmative care. And then they would just be accountable to the central advisory committee, which would be the task force. Um, so this is what we're trying to move towards per um, recommendation of literature. Okay, so this separate work group, that's the work group drafting the trans affirmative room placement guidelines. These are some elements that those guidelines include. Um, so how should staff interact with gender diverse patients? How should information about their identity be gathered? Um, you know, how is the decision making of their placement being documented? So there's a lot of oversight. Um, and that's to prevent discriminatory um, practices of just segregating someone into a single room without much consideration, um, which can be seen as very discriminatory. Um, and then, you know, really encouraging and guiding people to place a patient per their gender identity. Um, and then, um, 
if there is a case where someone is being placed in a private room, you know, there's a lot of stress and emphasis that this should only be done if there's safety concerns um, or when that person is requesting a single room for their preference for uh, privacy. And then it's also stressed that it should be reiterated that that's an optional um, occurrence and that, you know, if they were to change their mind, they could. And then also discussing bathrooms and shower facilities and then managing uh, cisgender patient reactions. So um, there's this fear as we talk about these guidelines of what is the cisgender patient going to do? Um, you know, are they going to view a, a single room given to a gender diverse person per their preference for privacy? Is that an unjust privilege? Um, and then sometimes there's just being able to see someone who's gender diverse, having the ability to walk down the hallway that matches their gender identity but may not necessarily uh, match their sex assigned at birth. And if that's recognized by other patients, there could be some resentment there. And so there's a lot of different types of reactions we have to consider when we write these guidelines so that we know how to manage the dynamics between the patients. <clears throat> so I'm not putting this here to brag, but it's just, again, to offer some ideas of what you could do if you decide to you know, lead some initiatives within your organization. So as much as possible, disseminate training opportunities for cultural competence, uh, making edits to key intake forms so that gathering of gender identity information is facilitated. Um, and then with that, there's training on how to uh, solicit for that information, also how to treat that information, making sure that confidentiality is highly respected and, and pursued. Um, and then within our medical record, we've changed templates so that there's just more ability to um, share that information about someone's gender identity to other treatment um, staff so that those identified names and pronouns are being honored. And then we have a dis patient discharge survey that is um, very comprehensive and doesn't really focus solely on trans issues, but um, we wanted to make sure we looked at that survey to make sure that there's um, information being gathered about staff's respect of patient cultural backgrounds and other variables. Um, we want to look at how, how well do the providers include the patient into the decision-making process about their care and treatment. Um, and so that's just to help foster this sense of empowerment for patients so that they can speak up if they feel like you know, their needs are not being met. Um, I did get special permission to show this next slide, and this is an image of what our shared decision-making guide looks like. It's modified from SAMHSA, at least that's what I was told. Um, so this is something we share. Um, let me move us a little bit. This is what we share with patients um, so that <clears throat> they know how to interact with their provider they know what to ask, they know when to speak up. Um, it just helps them give, helps them have like a menu of things that they can consider to talk about and ask about when they are working with their provider. And when we say provider here, we mean their prescriber. So we have nurse practitioners, physician assistants, and psychiatrists. And then I will move us back up here. Um, so in the next year, we um, looked at our annual diversity training that's um, overseen by um, performance improvement, and that's a department within our hospital. And so we just want to make sure that what they had in terms of content was up to date and using 
sensitive language and considering all of the, you know, um, important as uh, aspects and elements that should be reviewed when someone is being trained in diversity. <clears throat> we gender neutralized um, some single occupancy staff bathrooms and we're eventually wanting to move towards single occupancy uh, patient bathrooms being gender neutralized. Um, we just have to really conduct a lot of research and bring that research for, forward to uh, leadership so we can justify and um, also just share, you know, how potential safety risks would be addressed. I hosted a training. Um, you know, we started the room placement guidelines. And those other ones are not necessary. The last bullet point just talks about um, making sure the clinicians, as they're engaging in treatment with the patients who are gender diverse, that they have ideas for discharge planning in terms of what kind of community resources they want to connect their patient or client to, and then other therapy materials, um, for example. I had them written down. Okay, so queer and transgender resiliency workbook, and then the coming out handbook by the Trevor Project. So those are some treatment resources I made available to all clinicians. So speaking vaguely, before we move on to the next slide, what have been some barriers to quality healthcare in your settings, if you're comfortable sharing? Oops, I'll go back. <laughs> yeah, and I'll take a look at the chat if folks want to answer that question. Or everybody actually should be able to unmute themselves. So feel free to raise your hand if you want to answer that question live. And could you repeat the question just to make sure that yeah. folks heard it okay? Yeah, so speaking vaguely, if you would like, what have been some barriers to quality health care in your settings that you've recognized for trans, trans individuals? So Thariah mentions coordinating across departments and clinics. Mm -hmm. Dr. Hunter. Hi, I would say that um, one barrier at my facility is just having a history of not handling this well, that um, trans veterans and gender diverse veterans um, have are just afraid to give us another shot mm. to get it right. Yeah. Thank you for those comments. Okay, well, if that's it, yeah, I can definitely relate to, you know, the difficulty of coordinating. Uh, and and there, I think part of that is just, there's a that mental health crisis that's going on in our nation. People are overworked, people are very stretched out thin. And so this one extra task that maybe a task force would like to, you know, <laughs> propose that someone engage in, you know, that takes more effort. Um, and then the status quo is, yeah, very hard to, um, to change. And then what this next slide says is, and this is, these are general barriers that have been identified in research, but um, again, failure to room trans patients per their gender identity. Um, and then let's see, lack of cultural competence, lack of follow through. Again, that takes more energy um, if they've done things a certain way that has been easier. And so that would pertain to um, overriding our medical record templates so that we are making sure there's orders put in place for other staff to honor identified pronouns and name. And then just refusal to display um, a person's identified name and pronouns. So we have we have um, monitors on each unit so that the patients can see what where they're at in their precaution levels 
And so on those monitors, there's first on a first name basis, patients' names are listed. Um, and so if someone were to have a name that maybe, let's say their legal name, but differs from their identified name and how they're how they're being referred to by staff and, uh, and their peers, they're essentially being outed uh, on those monitors. So we wanna make sure that's not happening. Um, and then just um, a failure to actually map, uh, monitor the quality of care issues that are occurring within an institution. And then again, lack of accommodation for someone's identified name and pronouns in the medical record. So when I do host trainings, these are some of the topics that I focus on. Um, and so just explaining the gender spectrum, gender dysphoria, the difference between gender and sexual orientation, um, different factors that influence quality of care, like um, microaggressions and unacknowledged privilege and attitudes that come through in how you talk about things with a patient. Again, the effects of minority status stress, um, examples of inclusive and affirming language, and then what discharge planning should look like. And that should um, include connecting patients to community re resources that are affirming. Um, and you all may know this already because us psychologists are kind of on the, on the cutting edge of science when it comes to sensitive language, but um, I teach about, you know, why you should avoid the term homosexual, um, why you should probably use heterosexual instead of straight to move the lexicon away from that heterosexual homosexual dichotomy. Um, <laughs> telling people it's okay to say gay, you know, because from my experience, people are fearful of not using the word homosexual because gay sounds too informal. Um, and then the problems with asking about someone's transition stage, if they're transitioned, um, because that uh, communicates that the person's not valid as they currently are. Um, and a lot of uh, gender diverse people have never accepted their assigned sex at birth. And so um, they don't see themselves as needing to transition into something different than what they already are. Um, and then reassignment surgery, and obviously, yeah, sex change operation. We now say gender affirming procedures. This comes from the inclusive language guidelines. Um, so sex assigned at birth instead of biological sex or birth sex. Um, you know, if someone is uh, intersex, you know, using terms like hermaphrodite, hermaphrodite is extremely um, offensive. And so if you're interested more in these terms, you know, you can look at the APA's inclusive language guidelines. Um, these considerations about gender uh, pronouns come from, let me see. This comes from Division 44, the pronoun fact sheet. And so even as you're talking to groups of people as you're presenting, it's better to say you all or everyone instead of you guys. And then as you're gathering information during an intake or a clinical interview, instead of saying, oh, do you have a brother or sister? You would say sibling. Same with um, husband or wife. You would say partner or spouse. So trying to gender neutralize everything to avoid um, excluding someone's identity from what you're asking about. Um, these have been my personal barriers to success with the task force. So just concerns for perceived reverse discrimination. Um, so for example, my trans affirmative care guidelines or room placement guidelines um, had to be expanded to include other populations um, because there was this concern that this one set of guidelines is not including other types of populations. Um, you know, just the approachability of administration depends on how busy they are, how not busy they are, and then just diminished membership over time, um, opposing views, um, people who um, just may not be in support of 
transaffirmative care within my setting. And just the environmental structure and how it's designed, it's very gender designed. We have women only spaces. And a lot of times that again, um, I get this recurring argument that there's concerns for re-traumatizing women who have had past sexual violence. So with that, there's this assumption that, you know, someone who's um, trans woman is sexually deviant. And so I have to find a research that, you know, goes against that to eventually support this reconstruction of the physical environment. Um, future plans, again, further integration, recruiting more, gender neutralizing more spaces. And then my lessons learned at, as I've gone through this process is, um, you know, safety of the patients is a really strong principle that I have to keep in mind every time I propose a new change. Um, and that, you know, those are the concerns that come up the most as I propose changes. Um, and then, I need a lot of patience and perseverance through this process. Um, and then some, some things that carry a lot of weight if you're trying to propose change is look at what your accredit accreditation body, so hospital systems have accreditation bodies, look at what their standards are and you know basically present those with your whatever case you're presenting. And then what are other hospital systems doing? So reinventing the wheel is um, more scary or scarier than um, just borrowing from somebody else who's, over, who's already done it. <laughs> so I tried to make that end uh, in a timely manner. Did anyone have any questions or has anything stood out for you that you may wanna try um, in your own setting? All right, so I think because we're nearing the end here, any open questions for Dr. Stengi? And I think I, I did have one. I didn't want to put it in the chat because I'm going against my <laughs> uh, own rules of being able to use the Q&A feature there. But um, I, I was curious, it, does the task force include feedback or input from folks with lived experience? Um, so I try to make sure that whoever is a part of the task force um, have some diversity variables that can add and make the group more heterogeneous. Um, where I'm at, I'm in a very homogeneous state. <laughs> I'm in Idaho. And so um, I would say overall, probably not as much as I would like. Mm -hmm. um, and then what I've tried to do is seek out um, feedback and suggestions from patients um, through the patient rights advocates. They're the ones who are in charge of suggestion box on the unit. And so they're going to start forwarding me any suggestions that pertain to what the task force does. So hopefully that'll add some more diversity. Great. Thank you for sharing that. I guess um, it's kind of similar. Um, I was just wondering what type of intersectional issues have you found that have come up? For example, perhaps um, if you are um, really addressing the needs of maybe trans identified um, clients who may also be living with a disability or they may be trans identified and also a member of a um, minoritized racial or ethnic group or or, or a whole host of things. So what type of intersectional issues have come up for you and what has been um, some of the things that have worked well in your setting? Hmm. I'm trying to think. I think there's been one case where I've noticed intersectionality and it had it didn't have to do with um, ethnicity or race, but this person had a lot of special medical needs. Um, and so, hmm, I think 
what happened in that situation because there were a lot of medical needs. That person ended up being placed in a single um, occupant room um, for the medical needs aspect. Um, but that also, um, you know, offered that person more privacy in terms of, um, you know, accommodating their gender identity. Uh, they were trans male and so there was less of a conflict there uh, in terms of you know what the treatment team was thinking as they were considering to place this person um, because the medical needs already um, basically caused that requirement of placing this person in a single room um, so I don't know if that answers your question but that's just an example of intersectionality that I've noticed um, again, there's not a lot of um, racial and ethnic diversity, um, and I can't really think of a case where someone was transgender and also had a uh, historically marginalized racial or ethnic identity. Thank you. We still have time for probably about one or two more questions, so don't be shy. Um, definitely unmute yourself, put it in the chat, or use that Q&A feature. So uh, Thuraya mentions, have you received any feedback about your advocacy efforts being too political? It's a really important question. Yes. <laughs> <I've> gotten... <laughs> Tell us more. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, I have gotten into pretty some pretty public arguments with um, people who are gatekeepers to channels of communication. And when I mean public, I mean this is an email chain that is, you know, reply all in front of many different people. Um, and so how I handled that is move away from the politics and stick to the ethics. And so for that person, I knew they were a social worker. And so I pulled up codes within their ethical guidelines and said, you know, here are your ethics, here are psychologist ethics pertaining to what you're arguing. Um, and I think it was the argument of, you know, refusal to honor identified names and pronouns. And um, eventually we were hushed by uh, the administrator because there were just concerns about how civil or not civil was this conversation going to go. Um, and so I felt good about how I handled it, you know, sticking to the ethics. Right, and it's interesting distinction there, right? How the personal becomes political and the political is personal. So thank you for, for sharing that. Yeah. One of yeah. I was wondering, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, 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 go ahead, Marie. One of the things I was wondering, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure many psychologists, their graduate school competencies and training um, does not include knowing how to get a bathroom um, changed on the label. So that's, um, I would imagine, um, you know, unique to each institution, but there are probably some skill sets that you learned in terms of advocating for just changing um, some of the physical structure. Is there anything that um, you think may be helpful for people in other areas? Because I know for myself, that's not something I usually think uh, about in terms of, um, you know, just rooms and who, to get things changed and labels and all of that. Yeah, I don't know everything. And so I, I, I feel like as long as I can meet with the right people who do know a lot more than me and I ask the right questions, then I can get the step-by-step, -step, what do I need to do next um, from other people who have more experience. So like the head of HR or the head of, um, you know, right now we're talking about funding for those suggestion boxes. So I would go to materials management. And then our administrator is very supportive. Um, and he attends a lot of these task force 
meetings and so I can ask him, hey, <laughs> what do I do? Um, and so the the changing the bathroom was really just a matter of changing the signs and it was that simple. And so we just had to discuss funding. And then we also, I met with the leadership about, you know, what are those signs gonna look like? So they're the least um, divisive as possible, but also accomplish that goal. So I really rely on other people's expertise. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. And looking at um, a couple of other comments here in the chat box, uh, Thraya is reminding folks of the fact that there is a new joint commission uh, equity standard that's also important to leverage if you need to you know, look at policies and requirements to mobilize mm -hmm. change in the system. Um, and then Dr. Tilden mentions, I think the comment box would really benefit the system. I remember being so confused about where to go with concerns about veterans who were being uh, consistently misgendered. Although there were a lot of allies, I didn't know who in leadership could help me address those issues. So kind of creating those clear lines to provide mm -hmm. feedback and communication. Yeah, and I don't know how other hospitals are formatted or structured, but um, our administrator and assistant administrator, they've attended my trainings and I know they attend supplemental trainings on this issue. And so I'm very, very fortunate there to have such openness to this. Um, and they're really my key links to change. And Dr. Sugenji, uh, could you uh, help us understand again the 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 task force, um, how interdisciplinary is it? You know, what other folks are included that have been really kind of key partners in case folks are kind of interested in how to mobilize efforts? What what, what did that look like for you all? Yeah, so the administrator, so a lot of the administrative staff are former, <laughs> I don't say former, but if they were to practice again and do clinical work, they would be social workers. Um, a lot of our clinicians are social workers or master level counselors. Our medical director is a psychiatrist and he oversees the prescribing staff and medical staff as well. Um, and then nursing, nurse management. So those are all nurses that are in charge of all the different unit managers. Um, and let's see, uh, medical records, they helped with reformatting templates. We also have IT people who are in charge of really changing templates within the medical record as well. Um, let's see, just clinicians um, and then performance improvement managers. Those can be nurses. Um, so it is very interdisciplinary. Yeah, it sounds like a combination of clinicians, administrators, IT folks, uh, mm -hmm. you know, getting the right people in the table to, to help move some of those changes is important. Um, security, well, sorry. Security, <laughs> security, yeah. Yeah, they help with thinking about um, danger and risk and safety. Thank you. Well, I know we are close to time, so I want to make sure that uh, we are respectful of everybody's schedules and that we wrap up here. So I'm gonna uh, just take the time right now to, again, thank you, uh, Dr. Stengi, for offering your expertise, really important work here and, and a really great example of how uh, folks in our position in psychology can take really leading roles to advocate and create uh, changes in our systems. I know it's not easy. It, it looks like a lot of work went into this, a lot of th thoughtful effort and uh, really making this, um, you know, really making this focused on the individuals that it impacts the most. I really appreciate you providing us with this framework and example and, and the expertise that you provide. Also wanted to give a special uh, thanks and shout out to our Division 18 Diversity Committee, uh, also our Division 18 Advocacy Committee, and then the folks from the VA section who have helped us uh, develop this series. Really could not have done this without all of you all. So 
just thank you for the team effort here to really continue to bring uh, awareness of really the, the potential here that we have in terms of uh, all being advocates. So hopefully you all will be able to join us again um, for next month's advocacy series webinar. I'll go ahead and put it up here again in case you haven't seen this announcement. Of course, we'll be sending out uh, additional information about this. Our next presenter, again, will be uh, on June 5th. We're going to have uh, Dr. April Alexander present on increasing the field's impact on social justice. So get excited about that presentation. We look forward to seeing you there. Please go ahead and register beforehand. Um, and again, we will be posting the recording for this webinar uh, here in the coming weeks. And again, it'll take us about four to six weeks to get you uh, those CEU certificates. So keep an eye out in your email for those as well. So Thank you again for being here with us, again, for supporting our webinar series, and we look forward to seeing you again next month. Take care. Thank you all.